If you want to know the chances of nuclear war over the island of Taiwan, you need to know what's going on in the mind of one man, China's president, Xi Jinping. We need to have a better understanding. Of what are his instincts? Uh, what does he want his legacy to be? The trouble is, it's surprisingly difficult to know. President Xi doesn't give wide-ranging interviews or use social media. And what we do know about him is tightly controlled by the Communist Party. His life story is hidden behind a brutal propaganda and censorship machine. So what really happened in President Xi's past to make him the man he is today? He saw terrible things. His own family suffered terrible things. And what might this tell us about his ambitions for China and its place in the world? This is the image Xi Jinping wants you to see. The helmsman, to use a title state media sometimes give him, guiding the nation forward. He has an extremely sophisticated, well-crafted image in the state media, and that is the only media that people in China can see. They're very good at showing him as this kind of, a cross between a man of the people and a kind of benevolent monarch. Alongside the military parades, He's also often seen swapping anecdotes with the party faithful. He plays up the fact that, you know, he and his youth was in a village, that he's a man of the people. But his carefully curated image as an everyman couldn't be further from the truth. President Xi was born into Communist Party royalty. His father was a revolutionary pioneer and high-ranking party member. And Xi was part of the generation known as the Princelings. He grew up in immense privilege. He went to a top boarding school with orchards and a swimming pool and ate really high quality food at a time when you know, hundreds of millions of Chinese were living in abject poverty. Uh, this is my boarding school. And this is our classrooms. Li Nanyang was one of Xi's contemporaries, a fellow child of the elite. Her father knew Xi's dad, and like him, she grew up in an elite school. I was in the elementary school that was a boarding school. Most of my classmates' uh, parents came from the same ministry, from my father's ministry. So we played really well together. But this gilded childhood didn't last. When Xi Jinping and Li Nanyang were both just nine years old, their fathers were purged in the political struggles caused by Mao Zedong. Because he didn't trust his own elites, at certain key moments, Chairman Mao decided to basically blow up his own system. He felt that that protected him from his own enemies inside China's ruling establishment. He had you know, heavy weaponry being used in some cities. You had instances of cannibalism uh, where people ate their own enemies in a kind of bloodlust. Both Nanyang and Xi's fathers were jailed during the purges, and Nanyang can sympathize with what Xi must have gone through. My father's position was lower than Xi Jinping's father, so I could imagine the job from the top level to the lower level uh, must be even more tremendous towards Xi Jinping than me. All of a sudden, the people become very strange and they kept distance from you and even some adults show their hatred toward you. You couldn't understand as a nine years old child. This chaos seems to have had a profound impact on young Xi and helped to shape his view of power. He's given some extraordinary kind of interviews before he became the top leader, where he's talked about, you know, some people see the kind of the, the, the parades and the flowers when they think of power, but he can still remember the, what he calls the bullpens, these kind of makeshift prisons where people who are purged in the Mao years were placed. The extreme brutality of his own youth taught him the lesson that China can look stable, but that chaos is always 
a possibility if you don't have absolute discipline and if you don't focus on national security. If you want to know more about how Xi Jinping's childhood shaped his vision for China, you should check out The Prince. It's The Economist's first ever long-form podcast series, and I'm really excited to be hosting it. To listen, click on the link. While Xi has openly spoken about the horror of his childhood and the lessons it taught him, he presents a much rosier view of his teenage years. Aged 15, he was sent down to the countryside to do hard manual labour as part of Mao Zedong's cultural revolution. Many special trains depart, carrying students to the countryside. The idea was that urban youth should learn from the peasantry to strengthen their revolutionary spirit. For millions of Chinese of his generation, that was a disaster. That was where they missed out on their entire education. Many of them never recovered the chance to have a good schooling or a good university education. Many of them feel that those were completely lost years. But for President Xi, being sent to the countryside was, he says, a character building experience. One that would make him the leader he is today. And it is this experience, working the land and living in a humble cave, that he draws on when he presents himself as a man of the people. But it wasn't quite that simple. At first, he hated hard labour and actually ran away. He says he didn't know how to work in the countryside in the ways that were required of him. And he took up smoking because that was like an acceptable way for him to take a break. After just three months, he flees and goes back to the city where he then is sentenced to a hard labour gang and has to lay sewer pipes. You might expect that these experiences in his youth would have led him to hate the Communist Party. But it seems to have had the opposite effect. Nanyang says it's easy to see why. My generation, the only job was to be a revolutionary. Otherwise, you become the counter-revolutionary. There's no another way. Xi Jinping didn't lose his devotion and in fact decided that the party was the only game in town. And perhaps a lesson Xi Jinping learned from Mao and from his own childhood was that no one is safe unless you are at the very top of the Communist Party. His first move was to climb the party ladder as a local official. We don't have that much information about what Xi Jinping was doing in the provinces, but Xi Jinping took an approach of hiding and biding. So he wanted to keep a very low profile while he was rising through the ranks of the Communist Party. In rarely seen footage from the time, he seems a devoted family man. And he is nearly overshadowed by his baby daughter, Ming Zhe. <laughs> when this clip was filmed, he was working as a local official in Fujian province. The official story of his time there is that the economy grew and pollution decreased. But actually, the biggest corruption scandal in Chinese history was unfolding. The man at the center of it was Lai Chang Sing. He ran a multi billion dollar smuggling ring for goods, including cars and oil, through the port in Fujian province, where Xi Jinping was a senior party official and later governor. What's really interesting is that hundreds of government officials had their careers ended because of this scandal, but not Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping not only escaped unscathed, he was actually promoted to an even better job within the Communist Party. Was Xi aware of the smuggling ring? Some of his closest colleagues were implicated, but there's no evidence he was involved. He would continue his quiet ascent until the Party Congress in 2007, 
when it became clear that his time in the provinces had paid off and C was in line for the top job. The first time that the outside world knew for sure that Xi Jinping was going to be the top leader of the Communist Party was when people looked at the order that they walked on stage and they saw that Xi Jinping was in front of a man called Li Keqiang, who was the other possible top guy. And that level of secrecy is like something from a history book. It's like something from, you know, Stalin's Soviet Union. And that is still how China runs itself in 2022. So what would Xi Jinping want for China? After surviving the chaos of the Cultural Revolution, security and stability were front and center. There is a new focus, a really dramatic focus on national security. There needs to be constant vigilance, discipline, order, security, suspicion of outsiders. To achieve this, Xi wasted no time in eliminating the opposition via a wholesale crackdown on corruption, which was even dramatised in this hit TV show. One of the remarkable things is that 10 years into his rule, we really do not see overt challenges to him. Well, there's one faction, the Xi Jinping faction, and that's in charge. He has maintained control by dramatically increasing the level of surveillance over half of the world's CCTV cameras are now in China. And he has kept track of his citizens online. Eric Liu has seen this from the inside. He used to work 11 hours a day censoring content on Weibo, the Chinese equivalent of Twitter. Uh, Eric says after Xi Jinping took over, censorship around the leader's image dramatically increased. Ten years ago, 120 censors worked alongside Eric at Weibo. Now, he says tech companies have tens of thousands, editing online content in almost real time. It's essentially a bet that previous attempts at a kind of absolute police state, that they failed, not because it's impossible, but because you couldn't do it with kind of filing cabinets and guys listening on the phone. But if you have AI, if you have enough computing power, that you can make it work for the first time in human history. You have a police state that believes it has the technology to have total knowledge of what an entire population is doing. Xi's tight grip of the population may now continue for decades. In 2018, two term limits for the president and vice president were scrapped so that Xi can effectively rule for life. The argument is you need one man who has the trust of the entire Chinese people, the helmsman steering the ship of China through this sort of epochal storm. So given his focus on national security, what might this mean for the rest of the world? Xi has proved capable of fearsome shows of strength, as in Hong Kong, and a willingness to embrace more aggressive rhetoric. Under Xi Jinping, China's tone has become a lot sharper. Uh, Chinese diplomats going out on television in the outside world and saying surprisingly aggressive things. That kind of directive, that comes from Xi Jinping. The question of the moment is what might this mean for the island of Taiwan? Could Xi feel that he has unfinished business there? If Xi Jinping could successfully invade and take Taiwan, then he would be the final victor of the Chinese civil war that ended in 1949. He would be greater than Mao Zedong who won but didn't finish it. And so that would make him an immortal in Chinese history. Or has he invested too much in making China strong and prosperous to risk it all on a war that could provoke another nuclear superpower? No matter his decision, the actions of Xi Jinping will continue to shape China 
and all our lives for years to come. I'm Su Lin Wong. I'm the host of The Economist's first ever long form podcast series. It's about Xi Jinping and it's called The Prince. To listen, click on the link. Thank you very much for watching and don't forget to subscribe.